Hi, everyone. Welcome. This is the eighth signature 10 years on project panel um, titled Displacement Disruption and Scholarly, Scholarly Production in the Aftermath of Uprisings. My name is Layla, and I'm joined today by three wonderful speakers and presenters and, and scholars. Um, I'm going to give a brief introduction, and then we're going to dive in to hearing from our presenters. So 10 years on from the uprisings in the Arab world, and with similar anniversaries in Iran and Turkey just past or upcoming, the specific effects of the displacements triggered in the aftermath of these events remain understudied. For example, in much of the region, counter-revolutionary forces have targeted universities and scholars, clamping down on academic freedoms, criminalizing forms of research and study, and even reframe, reframing whole disciplines around national security priorities. Among the many impacts of authoritarian retrenchment has been a significant brain drain from parts of the region. So we're gonna start off by hearing general sort of reflections um, and, and trends that our presenters have been seeing in relation to this, this topic and these themes. Uh, and then we'll go into some more specific questions on uh, topics that they have prepared. We're gonna start with, um, with Basilius and I'm gonna ask each of you to just introduce yourselves briefly um, before your remarks. Hi everyone. Uh, hi Laila, thank you for the introduction and I'm glad to be with uh, such wonderful uh, colleague Bengi and everyone here. Uh, so uh, my name is Basilio Zeno, currently I'm Carl Lewistein Fellow and uh, a visiting uh, a professor at the University at Amherst College um, in Massachusetts. Uh, uh, my PhD is in political science, so that's, that's my field. Uh, I research basically sectarianism and displ forced displacement and migration, and particularly legal violence in the United States and also in countries like Syria. Uh, to reflect on your uh, question about the trend, so it's almost a decade. Uh, so uh, this decade uh, practically in the context of the Syrian displacement and post uh, displacement had fundamentally reshaped the country in many ways, definitely to the worst. Uh, so uh, for instance, uh, you ask about uh, reshaping and cramping down on uh, certain fields and uh, in, uh, in terms of academic freedom, which was non-existent in the context of the Syrian, uh, uh, in the Syrian context, even before the war. So it's, it's not like the conflict shaped the uh, field. So discussing authoritarianism or including even Syria as in, in comparative study is, uh, wasn't possible at all. Um, so I, I want to reflect here on two main uh, points where ha that had uh, been fundamentally shaped by the conflict, displacement, but also would uh, reshape the, the future of, uh, of Syria as a, a country as a, and as a society. And these two factors are how the war and the uprising and the consolidation of authoritarian uh, regime in, in Syria basically uh, restructure all aspects of intellectual thinking and also research. Uh, that covers two aspects. First of all, uh, you have primary and secondary school so basically children, uh, like school age children have been fundamentally affected by the war. Uh, over 7,000 schools have been destroyed in Syria, one out of three. So over 50% of uh, children out of school for several years now. And the second part is high education. And there are two levels here. The first level is those who couldn't uh, complete their uh, degree in terms of let's say a BA or MA or PhD. Uh, because of displacement or sometimes because of retaliation from the government. Uh, the second factor here is the lack of accreditation. So even when they are displaced, let's say they made the trip to the United States or Germany, these countries are requesting document as if someone is applying for a job or they, they are coming from a, a normal condition. So that basically in, in many ways destroyed uh, the social capital, but also those who had 
already accumulated experience for 10 years, 15 years before coming to becoming displaced. And they found very difficult uh, time, not in terms of being uh, integrated into academic system there, but also not being recognized as, as a scholar coming from uh, uh, conflict um, like, like Syria, like Libya, like Yemen and, and others. Uh, so I have uh, the second factor uh, I wanna add to is in the post uprising, definitely many countries and many settings um, uh, became near impossible for uh, direct field work. So uh, like in order to conduct like ethnographic field work in countries like Yemen, Syria, Libya, and, and increasingly in Turkey, it's becoming increasingly dangerous and difficult, not only for the scholar, and if you are from these country, but also to their families. Whereas you, if you are a scholar with um, um, a European citizenship or an American citizenship, you are less likely to be affected uh, by uh, the retaliatory measures uh, in comparison with the scholars actually from the region. So uh, I will, I will, uh, I have more other thoughts and comments, but I, I wanna give the space also for my colleague to comment. Thank you so much. Um, wonderful, let's move along to Bengi. Hi, um, so thank you everyone for being here and thank, thanks to the organizers who brought this panel together. Um, so like my, my name is Selim Benge Gumrikçu and I'm a political scientist uh, as Basilius, I'm from Turkey. And uh, since 2018, I've been working as first as a visiting scholar, then as a postdoctoral associate at Rutgers University uh, in New Jersey, USA. Um, my research generally focuses on uh, democracy and authoritarianism, but as well as uh, the role of social movements and collective action um, and how these are mobilized and also, you know, like how uh, some, some of the incumbent um, authoritarian governments are mobilizing people in their, in their, in their own sake. Um, so I guess, you know, like for this topic uh, of the panel, I can say that the academic freedom um, is, you know, like intrinsically um, linked to the rule of law and fundamental rights. Um, most, most notably, you know, like the free speech in general. And for the Turkish case, I can say that although academic freedom has been constitutionally embedded in, in the country's politics for a while now, uh, academia has been under increased pressure recently uh, with the rising authoritarianism of the AKP government, which accelerated after the Gezi Park protests in 2013. Mm -hmm. Of course, this doesn't mean that, you know, like the universities were the cradle of democracy before the AKP government. Uh, and indeed, we can say that Turkey's academia, you know, like has long suffered from political uh, repression, um, especially in the 1970s and 80s, following the military interventions, and especially after 1980 military coup, a massive number of academics were pushed from their, you know, like positions. And as I said, you know, like uh, the the um, the academic, you know, like uh, the, the autonomy of the of the universities were kind of guaranteed by the constitution. However, following the coup in 1980, uh, we have seen a setback, uh, a significant setback to this autonomy by the establishment of what we call as YÖK in Turkish, the Higher Education Council um, in Turkey. So when I think about, you know, like academic uh, freedom and the decline of academic freedoms in the Turkish context, I try to locate it within the context of uh, the most recent, you know, like um, decline um, of democracy and also, you know, like the most recent debates on the rule of law backsliding in Turkey. Um, and I believe that, you know, um, we, can, we can have a look at the impact of this backsliding uh, on academic freedoms on two levels. One of them is the macro level and the other one is the micro level. At the macro level, we can look at, have a look at um, the general situation in the universities in Turkey from a, you know, like institutional perspective. And at the micro level, we can talk about um, the, the experiences of individual scholars uh, who have been subject to one form of overt or covert repression. And, those scholars who are displaced now because of the repression and also those scholars who are still in, in Turkey. And I also think that we can generally think about, you know, like the alternatives that are developed um, 
in these countries as a, as a reaction to the increasing authoritarianism and declining academic freedoms. And I would be happy to talk more about the details of this uh, in the next round, let's say. Thank you. Thank you. Evren, moving on to you. Uh, yes, hi. Uh, thank you again. Uh, my name is Evren, uh, Evren Altinkas. I am also from Turkey. Uh, and um, my, my, my field of expertise is a mixture of uh, international relations, political science, and history. Uh, currently, I'm here at the uh, University of Guelph in Canada in the Department of History as a visiting assistant professor since 2018. And uh, when we talk about academic freedoms and the political uprisings and everything that has been going on in the region since 2010, uh, I, 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 want to, I, I mostly want to focus on what happened in uh, Turkey, of course, uh, but uh, as, as, as Benge said, uh, the, 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 the Turkish academia uh, has always been problematic when it comes to academic freedom. Uh, it was also before 1980s, when we look at 1960s and 70s, uh, the academic freedom in Turkish academia was limited to ideological conflicts uh, between uh, certain political groups, uh, which were shaped by the Cold War, actually. And after 1980, with the establishment of Higher Education Council, uh, we witnessed the, the Turkish academia to be transformed into, a, into an advanced high school in terms of the curriculum offered at the universities. Uh, I'm not going to divide my uh, talk into my macro or mi micro levels as uh, Benge did in a, in a perfect way, but I just want to give a wonderful example to show you uh, what how the Turkish academia was before Gezi. I, I consider Gezi protests in 2013 as a key, as, as a milestone uh, regarding the AKP and the Turkish government's uh, direct uh, intervention into the, into the academy. But before 2013, let's go back to 1980s when the Higher Education Council was established and when this purge at the universities happened, uh, the, the universe, there, were, there were a number of universities which needed professors to teach because there were students who were enrolled at universities. So what the government did, what the Higher Education, education Council did was to look at some night schools and to some... Um, occupational schools which were teaching at high school levels like like fine arts you know uh, things like based on skills and they took the teachers you know without any phds without any doctorates and transformed them into university professors uh, they they i mean at one night uh, they became they were they were teachers at high school but next day uh, they were uh, they were assistant professors with no doctor title uh, in the departments of uh, fine arts, in the departments of psychology, etc. So, and these people without the doctorate, without a title of PhD, without the title of doctor, have started to raise the new generations in Turkey, starting from 1980s. Not, I'm not saying that all of them were the ones without a PhD, but this was the beginning of the moment of the, of the process when questioning of the authority, when you know, using scientific methods to teach was left aside uh, it, in most of the universities. They became department chairs, they became deans, they became uh, provosts or rectors. Uh, and when you look back to 1980s, you will see a lot of department chairs, deans and rectors without a doctor in front of their names because they didn't have a doctorate. So, and these people uh, started to run the academic and scientific environment in Turkey. So uh, how could we expect a, a generation of uh, you know, academics uh, who were uh, worshiping or let's say, who, who were uh, supporting the academic freedom and freedom of you know, expression 
in their uh, lectures, in their uh, publications, uh, if their uh, department chairs or if their professors came from this background. So this was a major strike. And when in 2013, the Gezi protests happened, uh, the, the AKP government, which had very clo close ties with university professors, with, with the liberal university professors regarding uh, its legitimacy or justification uh, in the first phase of AKP, I always divide it into two, pre-Gezi pre and post-Gezi. So during the pre-Gezi period, AKP legitimized itself by having close ties with the university professors, by using their uh, platform, their uh, voice uh, as a way to justify itself and to be accepted within the society. After Gezi, uh, AKP started to push them away. And the real problems on academic freedom, if we call it academic freedom, I'm using the quotation marks again, started with uh, 2013 because now it was time for all the segments of academic world to face these uh, autocratic policies of the Turkish government, which was a byproduct of Turkish Islamic synthesis, which was introduced with 1980 revolution. So, or military coup, sorry. So uh, I don't know. So I don't know who will speak after me, but uh, when we come back to that, uh, I would like to talk about the post Gezi and how the academic uh, world in Turkey has transformed into an academy without academics. Thank you. Thank you so much. Murad, we'll pass it on to you. Well, thank you so much, Laila. And uh, I'd like to welcome you all uh, for uh, this uh, session. I'm sorry for being uh, late a little bit. I got confused. Uh, but we'll talk about uh, the displacement in academia. So I'm, I'm, my name is Murad al -Sana. I'm uh, from, I'm a uh, Palestinian from Israel. And uh, I now teach as an adjunct at the American University <clears throat> and uh, searching for, do, for new uh, opportunities. So uh, truly to talk about displacement in Palestine, you, you, you will need a longer time because uh, everything in Palestine is about the displacement. Uh, Palestinians were displacement, displaced since 1948, and they continue to be displaced, even though the United Nations and many Arab countries issued uh, decisions to stop this displacement, they never stop. And uh, until today, uh, every uh, day we hear about uh, another displacement uh, for the Palestinians from Sheikh Jarrah, the, the recent one that up into the news. But there are many cases, uh, for example, the Arab uh, Bedouins in the Negev who are getting displacement uh, every day. And the, the displacement is not only in the, uh, let's say, geographical level that people get displaced because of the dispute over land or over uh, legal issues, but uh, it's almost in, in every field of our life. For example, when we talk about uh, academia, it is uh, very important to notice that uh, uh, the Palestinians in general, and especially Palestinian scholars, do not exactly have a space in, in the Israeli academia. First of all, you have to know that in, in Israel, there is no uh, uh, Arab Palestinians one university. And there is a, a kind of uh, political decision to prevent establishing a Palestinian university or Arab, Palestine, or Arab university in, in, in Israel. So many of the academics, they cannot find themselves in the Israeli uh, institutes. So many of them are uh, migrating to the United States or to European universities. Yeah, some of them even go to some of the Palestinian universities and institutes in the Palestinian uh, occupied territories like uh, Berzet and uh, East Jerusalem and uh, all these places. And uh, little who got accepted or find their uh, spaces in Israel. I'm not saying that there are none, but uh, the rate among the professors and the uh, staff in the universities is not more than 2%, while the Arab Palestinians 
make about 20% from the Israeli population. So it's not only that they got displaced because of the hiring and the space, but also many times they cannot find uh, their place in the research. That means the interest in the institute's research is not uh, directed toward the uh, Arab-Palestinians issues in Israel. That means you will find many uh, research projects or fields of projects. Uh, none of them or, or very little of these research and the budgets are directed toward the issues of the Palestinians in Israel. For example, the issue of uh, violence today, many of the issues related to discrimination and all these things. Uh, Although it is little, but there are recently some of the Israeli scholars from the left, from the left side who are trying to raise the issues of discrimination and the, these issues that the disfranchising of the Palestinian scholars from the academia in Israel and uh, pushing them to move, to migrate, to find their places in, in other uh, academic institutes in, in Europe and in the United States uh, uh, mainly. So uh, these things is, is not like, for example, uh, other places because the Palestinians in Israel are not an opposition. They are not a political opposition. They are considered to be a different uh, nation, different people. And uh, many times uh, in some places, they are continue to be considered as part of the enemy in the state of Israel. I mean that the conflict between the Palestinians in the occupied territories and Israelis all the time affects the, the reality of the relationship between the uh, Palestinians in, in Israel in all life levels. But uh, in academia, it is, uh, it is uh, very obvious. Uh, uh, I have uh, uh, exposed uh, several times to uh, uh, grants that where uh, I submitted the proposals around the issues uh, related to the Arab Palestinians in Israel. And in my proposals, I usually write the Arab Palestinians in Israel. One of these uh, proposals retained my, uh, my proposal stating that uh, the Arabs in Israel are not Palestinians. And he rejected my proposal. So this is only an indication of how the political views affect the academia and our freedom of uh, uh, expression or uh, freedom of uh, uh, research in these uh, places. Uh, so this is only in short, I don't want to take longer time. I don't know how long uh, time uh, is uh, dedicated for each one of us, but I will uh, stop here. And uh, if we have time later on, I can uh, elaborate or comment in other issues. You're on mute. Lana. I was muted. Thank mm -hmm. you so much. Um, that was perfect. And so, uh, our presenters have also prepared some more sp uh, specific comments on, on, a, on a range of topics. So we're going to move now to hearing about those things, and we'll keep the same order. So Basilius, we'll start with you. OK, hi. Hi again. <laughs> uh, so uh, the second part of the uh, uh, conversation is basically about, uh, from my understanding, it's about our direct engagement with research within this uh, basically structure, changing structure of academic freedom and uh, structural challenges that we face. Uh, as uh, Murad commented, there are sometimes constraints that are imposed like on, on individuals from certain ethnicity or, or considered as a different nation on, the, on, on, on their land. Uh, so, uh, the second part is, uh, uh, so I conducted the extensive ethnographic field work with the uh, asylum seekers, Syrian asylum seekers and refugees in the United States, in, including those who are holding something called the TBS, which is a temporary protection status, uh, which is renewable every 18 months if the government decided that the country condition doesn't allow uh, uh, people to return. So this is a, a pattern of uncertainty. 
so during my interviews, I found, so I, I just published a piece like a couple of weeks ago where I focus on the, um, I call it education and alienation. Uh, specifically, I focus on the challenges that face a school age uh, children uh, due to the disruption and this, uh, of education and the destruction of uh, infrastructure in Syria, including other factors that remain um, understudied. There are reports, but they remain understudied. Uh, so most uh, refugees who ended up basically relocated in uh, countries like the United States are basically went through at least three, four uh, waves of displacement before being relocated after vetting and it's a long process that I uh, don't have time to talk about it then when they are resettled here the uh, the families basically are integrated into the American racialized poverty system uh, why I'm saying that because they don't have sustainable support uh, that takes the uh, basically psychological and also material needs for uh, children or even uh, uh, those who are in college age and want to be uh, want to continue their studies uh, because the government the state department and the resettlement agency uh, basically you have to sign off on a document where you will pay off the flight ticket in the u.s after several months so basically you come here with nothing and then you find if you are a family of five or six, so you are already in debt to $6,000 to the government. So which means and the, they, the, the burden, like financial burden is already on families who are there. So basically the argument for the government here is to uh, support and motivate refugees to work uh, hard and be integrated in the economic system. Uh, so Germany follow a very different system uh, which emphasize cultural integration, the U.S. emphasized economic integration. So that created, uh, based on my field work in California, for instance, a disruption. So basically, if you are a children with the age of uh, uh, 13 or 14 year old, but basically you only, you should be in the second or third grade after you, you were basically expelled or fled from, from Syria. So basically you have seven, eight years gap. So they put these students into a system that accommodate their age, but not their educational age, which means they should be in the second grade, but instead you are in the 10th grade. So that create a process, uh, exacerbate the conditions of alienation, where students uh, feel they are alienated because of also language barrier. So you are in, in, in a new system and you try to think, and they are uh, in different language and different structure, and they experience, especially under Trump, and continue uh, xenophobia, like bullying in school. Uh, so that created an alienation within that system. So they are alienated from their peers and their colleagues, alienated from their teachers, and alienated from the whole structure, which affect their mental and, and, uh, and well-being, and affect their actually progress as, as uh, a student in a different setting. Some, of course, survive this process, but what I'm saying is the structure itself is violent. And we tend to focus on authoritarian setting and the overall majority, of course, like over 89 uh, or 82% of refugees worldwide have been relocated in global south, not the global north. So like scholars tend to focus on the global south, but there is a normalization of the situation here as if it's, it's everything is, is fine. So the second factor, now this is the children. The second factor that I found is those who uh, fled from the country and wanted to continue their study, they found that many universities here request their transcript. They request like many official documents that the government, uh, including like the Syrian government, like don't, uh, withheld, they don't give it to, to them. So basically they lose uh, the opportunity to, to continue and pursue their uh, higher education, even though they have the, the qualification and aspiration to do that. Uh, so that's created a, that to relate to the question of uh, knowledge production, a hierarchy in terms of knowledge production, where basically only scholars from global north, the condition allow scholars in the global north with 
the uh, with citizenship from these countries to actually to conduct to uh, to use theories from the global north and the data from the global south whereas many actually scholars who were displaced from the global south has both the first hand experience and the theory from the region actually to apply that but you the conditions within the institution the academic institution which is still eurocentric which is still white uh, basically expel them or at least add burden on them to uh, to to have access to the very same uh, uh, status including grants for instance if you want to apply for uh, fulbright you are ineligible if you aren't american or don't have uh, uh, permanent residency uh, the third factor that i want to emphasize is mobility uh, i had to conduct my field work this is how our positionality as scholars shape our research shape our uh, research question case study and also access to communities within which we we want to conduct basically field work uh, i wasn't able to leave the country even before the pandemic for almost eight years nine years so that shaped basically the case study that i'm conducting even though i had a, a scholarship from open society foundation at the time to conduct a comparative study between germany and the united states but if I left the country, so the U.S. wouldn't allow me to come back, so which would disrupt actually my my uh, my PhD degree at the time. So I had to reshape all my structure and my research question to focus in the U.S. So that's a layer of invisible violence that is sustained within the the United States and shape actually the way how we ask questions, the way how we conduct research, the way we choose certain method but not others. Uh, so. Uh, one final point i want to uh, yeah the final point that i want to make is based on also uh, like a, a personal experience direct experience so up until i left syria in 2012 i was doing my phd in archaeology so i was a phd candidate working on my data then with the exacerbation of the conflict i had to flee the country came to the us in 2014 uh, damascus university expelled me from the program without notification so they ended basically over 10 to 15 years like of accumulated knowledge and uh, uh, better like half of the dissertation was was ready. So in, and in the US, I had to start from scratch with a new field, which is political science, because that's another passion that I, I wanted to pursue. Uh, but what I mean that many actually who had experience for a decade long found themselves actually thrown into conditions where they lost all the experiences because they weren't recognized by the state within which they found themselves uh, uh, seeking uh, either asylum or a refugee or migrants in this setting so that's basically um, a contextualization of their uh, lived experience actually with the research that i'm doing thank you so much thank you thank you on to you Yes, um, thank you. So um, given the time limit, I'm actually going to, you know, like skip some information about like the background of democratic backsliding in Turkey in the recent years and jump directly um, to, you know, like how the universities has changed uh, after the Gezi Park protests and especially um, the failed coup attempt in 2016. So let me say that, you know, like, um, during the Gezi Park protests, for example, we have seen um, some, you know, like foreign students who has been deported and reportedly interrogated uh, about their, you know, like studies on sensitive issues in, in the country. Um, and it is also reported that the Council of Higher Education, which everyone also mentioned, um, the central, you know, like institution that is foreseeing the universities, um, started some investigations um, targeting the students and as well as fac faculty members who supported and or attended the Gezi Park protests. According to the Initiative for Solidarity with Detained Students, for example, those, those students who were involved in the protests uh, were forced to, you know, like choose between their rights as citizens and the right to education. Um, and those scholars who have participated in a, you know, like one day work stop, stoppage event um, by the major public sector union in the country um, were uh, subjected to disciplinary processes. According to, uh, according to the, to, to the, un, to the union, um, 
of education and science laborers, if I would want to, you know, like translate it into English, um, the situation turned into uh, what they call as a witch hunt, uh, especially after after the Gezi Park protests. So as I said, you know, like the academics who participated in the protests or kind of, you know, like postpone their exams just to leave some space for their students to participate in the events uh, were um, reported to the university administrations um, by what, can I, what I can call as informant citizens or informant students. Uh, and upon these reports, the administrations, the university administrations started disciplinary processes which in some cases ended with the firing of these scholars. Um, so with, within this process, according to, you know, like some unionists, um, the, the, the government used the Higher Education Council as sort of a weapon in order to, you know, like defend itself. Um, but I also have to say that, uh, you know, like, even though, you know, like the grip over the academic freedom in, in the country tightened after the Gezi Park protests, the major blow came after the failed coup attempt uh, and the following emergency rule, which lasted for about three years following the failed coup attempt in the summer of 2016. Uh, after this, several thousand academics, uh, mostly the signatories of the petition, uh, the peace petition, uh, as they call it, uh, were expelled from their jobs, whereas 15 universities were shut down by uh, governmental decrees, uh, which are called in Turkish as KHK, which unfortunately became like a very well-known matter in Turkish politics. Um, and according to uh, scholars of, you know, like constitutional law, um, these, um, these KHKs, the governmental decrees, which, uh, which can be actually used to regulate matters that are related to the causes and the purposes of a given state of emergency uh, started to be used for matters far beyond these, their stated purposes. Uh, and that, unfortunately, the constitutional court remained silent about these irregularities. And uh, in addition, I can also say that, you know, like with this KHKs, with the governmental decrees, um, the, the, the university presidents in Turkey are no longer assigned by an elective commission within the university, but by the president of the republic. And I guess, you know, like the current events going on in Boazici University for about a year now uh, can also be read in this framework um, where the institutional autonomy of the universities are um, overridden by, by, the, by the government. Um, and I can also say that, you know, like uh, the, the, the results of this process has been dire for the universities in Turkey as the data, for example, from the Varieties of Democracy Project shows us that the level of academic freedom in Turkey right now uh, seems to back to what it was uh, right after the military coup in 1980. So the university has also went through some, you know, like structural changes. And according to the chair of the uh, Union of Scholars, uh, who, you know, like gave an interview to, to a major uh, news portal, the 40% of the existing academic and administrative staff of the universities has been shaped under the AKP governments. Um, and this is obviously not surprising if you would look at the numbers because we, we know that the government open, opened up you know like 60 um, no sorry 18, 86 new universities just between 2002 and 2012. Um, but we can also say that as with the you know like um, mass uh, expel or expulsion of the of the academics, uh, the universities are now sort of, you know, like deserted in, 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 in one sense. Uh, it is reported in 2020, for example, that um, about 300 departments uh, of 78 public universities do not have any assistant, associate, or full professor. Um, in, in addition to this data, we, we are also seeing that, you know, like about 1700 departments in the country operate with only uh, around five colleagues. Uh, also, again, you know, like according to some data from 2019, uh, 71 presidents of the university, 71 university presidents have uh, zero citations, uh, whereas, you know, like 60 something of these presidents have no international publication. 
So this is like the macro level. I, I know we are running out of time, so I'm gonna, you know, like briefly wanna touch on the micro level, um, which we can, you know, like uh, assess regarding the displaced scholars who had to uh, leave the country in order to be able to pursue their academic careers. And also, you know, like we can focus on those who are still working at the, at the universities, but I guess uh, because of time limits, I'm gonna, you know, like focus on the former. Um, well, well, first of all, let me say that, you know, like within the Turkish case, at least to my knowledge, uh, that research uh, or data, you know, like concerning these groups is rather limited, but we can, you know, like draw some observations based on some limited research as well as some experiences. Uh, first of all, you know, like there, there, there are several problems for these scholars who exited, uh, to use Hirschman's, you know, like terminology, uh, may have, you know, like um, difficulties adjusting to their host country's language, uh, culture, social lifestyle, and academic culture, and the classroom environment, which are obviously, you know, like totally different from the host country because it's a whole different, you know, like new culture. Um, it is, um, you know, like in, in also some cases we are seeing that the scholars uh, can be identified as uh, refugees in the host country, kind of cur curtailing their identities as academics. So this refugee identity can, you know, like surpass their, um, their academic identity and academic successes. Um, so we can also, you know, like, say that these scholars can, can struggle to start from scratch and prove themselves and prove their existence. Because think about it, these scholars, these displaced scholars did not exist uh, before in these host countries. So they did not have any, you know, like educational records, they did not have any health records, and also they need to gain recognition in their new, you know, like social and academic environments, especially if they are junior scholars, uh, which is kind of putting an extra burden, uh, an extra emotional burden, uh, slowing down the research and publication processes. Um, in, a, in a, you know, like recent research uh, based on some in-depth interviews with at-risk scholars, uh, this is, you know, like the, the language that is used by the article uh, from Turkey, which are based on in Europe today, Özdemir, for example, notes that, um, that the, the temporary provision of a safe research space and public services does not ensure ac access to the public ed, uh, academic space in which the exiled may freely appear. Uh, the opportunity is afforded to them through the fellowships, like um, through, you know, like several fellowships the, these uh, scholars can get, do not necessarily protect them from, you know, like marginalization within their host institutions. Because as I said, you know, like they are regarded as refugee scholars, they are regarded as temporary, so they are not necessarily, not in all the cases at least seen as equal, uh, you know, like colleagues. It is also clear, you know, like that these scholars, um, which was also, you know, like noted in this article uh, by Özdemir, that these scholars are finding themselves in an un undefined state of limbo. So those scholars do not know what is going to follow next, where they will be, you know, like um, next year, which institution they will be um, working at, if any, of course. And also this is kind of, you know, like fueling the feeling of not belonging uh, in the host country, um, which can, you know, like trigger some, um, you know, like mental health issues, as well as lack of motivation for settling down in that specific host uh, institution or country. Um, because they they don't know you know like what's going to happen next um, and I can all you know like finish by saying that we can only imagine um, how this process uh, is impacting the academic productivity of these scholars. Thank you, thank you, Bengi. Uh, we'll now move on to Evran. Yes, uh, thank you. So. Uh, what Dr. Gumrukh uh, covered in her presentation uh, is pretty much very similar to what I was going to talk about. So I don't want to repeat what uh, what has been told and skip to another part of the story. So first of all, yes, uh, all these problems 
or all these events that happened in Turkey after 2013 with the academics for peace, with the uh, military coup attempt, and then the ongoing a purge of the academics from the universities, which is around 6,000 actually. And of course, with the change of law and the president himself appointing the, the, the directors of the universities after 2018, uh, have been uh, some factors that turned the universities in Turkey into political um, institutions uh, which are ruled by the government. So which means that, of course, the universities have been ruled by the government, but now the rectors, the deans, the, the, the decision makers of these universities, when we look at them, a majority of them were either a candidates of AKP or MPs of AKP, Erdogan's political party in the last 19 years, uh, shows us that the universities have now turned into institutions of political brainwashing of the current government, actually. Of course, with some exceptions, but uh, this means that it is like an academy of, of, of AKP, like AKP Academy, how to, how to raise new uh, students who will be serving for the goals of the ruling party is the, has become the main goal of universities, unfortunately. So there is a recent uh, research conducted uh, in the universities of Turkey by Human Rights Watch Turkey. And according to this, to this research, the academics believe that 34% uh, of them believe that they do not talk about, that it is best for them not to talk about the sensitive, co sensitive content in their courses. So when they were asked what the sensitive content were, they said it was either the Kurdish problem or human rights problem or the concept of democracy. Some political science professors have mentioned that they are not talking about the basic principles of democracy in their political science lectures because they think these are sensitive topics. So it's, a, it, uh, it, it's one of the many problems. In addition to that, as, as Dr. Gumilkshi said, there are informant students and these students have become a source of threats and complaints. They use an, 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 an electronic system and they send a file complaints about the professors to the, to the government authorities by, by using the system called BIMAR or GMAR. These are the uh, institutional uh, names of the complaint systems of the Turkish government. Some students have complained about their professors who gave references from Michel Foucault, a French philosopher. And they said that their professor was conveying them the ideas of a gay thinker, a homosexual thinker. And this was a reason of complaint, for instance. We are talking about 2020 and Turkey and the university system in Turkey. In addition to that, 57 of the participating academicians in this uh, research, in this study, uh, said that they are not free in uh, academic activities. And 33% of them said that uh, they have shut down or closed their social media accounts after uh, 2016. So think about it, an academic environment yeah, with professors who have no social media accounts, who do not talk about sensitive topics and uh, who are being complained about to the government because of the readings they give to the students, so which are universally accepted uh, readings about philosophy or other topics that should be covered in any given context of sociology, political science, or whatsoever. So, this is the uh, this is the situation. This is the status of a Turkish uh, academy, unfortunately. And when it comes to people like us, uh, as as Bozerius gave examples, as Dr. Gumrukci gave examples. Uh, the people like us who, who have been displaced. For instance, I'm a displaced scholar myself. Uh, and my adventure began a little bit earlier than uh, other Turkish scholars because it started in 2013, right after Gezi protests. Uh, because I was an active participant of Gezi protests, I was uh, forced to resign from my position at the university because I was teaching at a public university in Turkey. And my... Uh, my, my, my supervisors wanted me to resign. They did their best under the name of mobbing to force me to uh, resign. And then after I resigned, 
I was unemployed for approximately five, uh, four years. And during this time, when I applied for positions, they kept on telling me, well, uh, because of your records, because of the things you did during your academic uh, position, because of your active involvement in Gezi, Gezi protests, you know, it's a little bit risky for us to hire you. Even the private universities say this. So it's not only the public universities, because after all, private universities are based or de are dependent upon the, the lips or the words of the Turkish president and decision makers, after all. So when I came to Canada in 2018, I faced very similar problems, as Basilius mentioned, and also as Dr. Gümrükçü mentioned. For instance, uh, since you have no records in, in a new country, you need to start over scratch. And of course, for the first couple of years, everything is fine because the university that you are uh, in uh, does its best to support you. You know, they do support you. They do uh, let you, they do give you a space to move, etc. But then after the first two years, after your um status as a scholar at risk starts to diminish because now you are no longer at risk and you are in a safe country, you uh, get into this competition. In this competitive environment, this competitive academic job market, as they call it, and then when you uh, apply for a position, you know, just to teach, or you know, just uh, like, uh, for instance, to a postdoc or to a scholarship or to a tenure track, there sometimes. Uh, you feel like when, when they sent you an email, they, you feel, they never say that, but you feel like, how dare you? Because, you know, I mean, come on, there are hundreds of people who have PhDs from American, from Canadian, from European universities, and you are someone who came from another part of the world with, under this aegis of scholar at risk or, you know, SRF or whatever you call it, under this a special arrangement or with, with a privilege, as they call it. And and how dare you apply for these positions? I mean, I dare to apply for these positions because guys, I cannot go back to my home country because the eyes and ears of my home country, the government are always on me. They know what I'm doing. They know what I'm teaching. They know what I'm saying. They probably watch me right now, okay? So, and if I want to go back to my home country, I know what will happen to me and to my family. So I am not a regular applicant like the rest of you guys, okay? I, I'm not one of those, but when I mention this in any kind of cover letter, I'm not talking about myself, I'm talking about all the displaced scholars actually. When I mention that I'm a displaced scholar, this also means that I'm seeking for a privilege, but I don't do that. I say, I'm, I have a PhD, these are my publications, these are the courses I teach, but then they say, well, you don't have a PhD from US, you don't have a PhD from Canada, so let's wait, okay? And then when you keep on waiting, the pressure on you increases, increases, doubles, triples, and it goes on and on. And, and as Benge said, the mental health issues arise. If you have a family with you, uh, you start to think about, you know, doing other jobs. And then you, uh, you have another rupture from academy. The rupture you had back in your home country because of your political views or because of your opposition to the government turns into another rupture from academy because you are not uh, a PA, you don't have a PhD from these, uh, these, these, these countries, then you start to find out other jobs. Most of the displaced scholars, I, I found out that after 2015, 2016, after a couple of years, have started to search for other jobs, like, like you know, regular jobs, nothing to do with their PhDs, nothing to do with their academic training. So here comes the, the final point I want to mention. People like us, uh, I'm displaced scholars, there have been a huge investment on us from our home countries, because most of us had PhDs or master's degrees uh, at public institutions, which meant we didn't spend a penny and our governments during the good times spent a lot on us, they invested on us, and we uh, because of our education, because of our ability, because of our skills, I, I believe that we have this uh, specific um, characteristic of to be considered like a national asset, but we are not a we are a national asset, but we are not in our home country, and we are here with all this investment made of us. But then uh, we are just one of the thousands who apply for the same job. I think this is a big problem. 
and uh, this should be dealt with uh, in, 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 in short term. Otherwise, all the dis displaced scholars will end in this loop of, uh, you know, going to non-academic jobs and ending as, you know, uh, as 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 as, as uh, under the jobs that had that don't necessitate any kind of training and all the training we had will be lost. So that's the final point I wanted to mention and thank you very much. And uh, I'm muting myself now. <laughs> thank you, thank you so much, Morad. On to you. Oh, first of all, I would like to thank uh, everyone so much and also Celine because. Uh, really, um, when you hear uh, these stories, uh, uh, many times uh, you see this yourself in these stories. Unfortunately, as uh, everyone have said, uh, uh, I have spent maybe about, um, let's say, bachelor and two masters and doctorate degree, all of them in a specific field, and now they worth nothing here. It's, uh, and uh, um, I, I feel that obligated many times to go to look for to search for a, a different job because at the end of the day I need to pay my rent. My kids needs uh, uh, some kind of uh, stuff and clothes and uh, bread and all these things. And when you don't have these things, you have to go to work on these things. And when you go to work, uh, you cannot make any research. You cannot write. You cannot uh, follow up even in your uh, applications to the universities. Uh, and uh, these things are really uh, frustrating you and this uh, sometimes causing uh, for you uh, mental disabilities. You start to think that what's going on and uh, uh, when you talk to, be, to people about these things, uh, especially unfortunately in the United States, uh, uh, rarely you find understandable uh, people who appreciate what happened to you. Uh, I had a very successful career when before I came here and uh, I was displaced with my family because is Israel passed the law in 2003 saying that uh, Palestinians from Israel who are citizens of Israel cannot uh, live in Israel with their spouses from the uh, occupied Palestinian territories. And I was married to a Palestinian woman who uh, I married here before this law and but they applied this law retroactively against me and many other families. So I could not live with my uh, wife uh, in my house, although we have everything there for four years. So I started to look for other places to accommodate myself and my family. And I came here to the United States at the beginning of, as a student. And then even if, uh, after I finished as a scholar, uh, they continue to see our uh, uh, education from our home countries, like uh, you did not uh, do your even, it's not only your doctorate, uh, Evan, it's also your your bachelor. Sometimes they look at it and they say you didn't finish your bachelor here. So it is very hard to find uh, for yourself uh, a, a new uh, a position, a new career here, and that uh, reflected into your uh, economic and in your uh, life. Many times I feel that my family and my kids see that we are a poor family. We are going to uh, places because we don't, we cannot afford. We live in places also that is is not uh, uh, good for uh, for for the kids because these places don't have usually good schools, and uh, this is like a, a, a dominant thing that affects you and then affects your kids and uh, etc. Cetera, etc. Cetera. So uh, unfortunately, uh, I don't know how to to deal until this day. I'm applying for so many positions for so many places. Uh, uh, rarely I even get some replies that, okay, we will contact you and all these things, okay? But uh, uh, I'm sorry to say that sometimes I feel I'm hopeless. Uh, I don't know how things are gonna proceed. I don't see myself uh, in academia here in the United States having uh, some kind of uh, future, but uh, that is uh, the reality that uh, we have to face. And uh, I'm trying to hold on, not to leave the academia, not to go to be a taxi driver <laughs> or uh, to work in any restaurant. But uh, unfortunately, I don't know how long I can hold uh, in this situation. Uh, 
Uh, and the other, the other issue for, for me, for example, when I came here, I could not apply for, for asylum. And that, uh, at the same time, I could not apply for immigration because I was not categorized under the uh, category of persecutes uh, people who are eligible for asylum in the United States because I was able to go back to, to my country and my wife was able to go back, but we were not allowed to live uh, together in, in Israel. So that uh, this condition, they said, does not apply for, for does not uh, make you eligible for asylum in the United States. So I stayed in this uh, limbo situation, unable to do anything without any kind of documentation, without any uh, visa work, uh, visa to work sometimes, and uh, also these things continue to affect my research and. Uh, uh, consume my time every time to go to apply for visas and to collect these documentations and to beg uh, so many uh, places to get that document and this document and to work, to wait for two or three, four months. You don't know whether you are gonna get this visa or not gonna get this visa. If you do not get this, you have to visa, you have to go back to your home country and start from the beginning. So it's a it's very stressful and hard uh, situation. Uh, this is not only my situation, so I know many of my colleagues who are Palestinians. For each one of them, he has his own reason uh, that pushed him out of his home to come to the United States or to Canada or to, or to Europe. Uh, for example, I will finish with uh, this uh, example. I have a colleague or a friend who was expelled from his position because he was doing a research on the children of Gaza and their psychological situation in the war. And uh, when they came to give him, uh, to renew his contract at the university, they told him, if you would like to continue to renew your contract here, to continue living here, you should, uh, you should not do your research only about the Palestinians in Gaza and focus in different places. That means they want you to do a research in places that important for them, not for the Arabs and for the Palestinians around uh, uh, the globe. Uh, yeah, and, uh, thank you, thank you for everything. And uh, I really find myself within a community that understand what's going on with me, uh, like uh, Selim Ebrin and uh, also Basilio and everybody here. Thank you so much, Murad. And I just wanna say, um, express deep gratitude to all of you for really, expressing some very painful things um, and and for bringing, bringing these issues to light in ways that they need to be brought to light. Um, we are approaching the end of our time. Um, and I uh, just to close us out, I, I wanna um, turn us, I wanna turn to Hamid. Unfortunately, I don't think we have time for additional questions. We're ending at 5 p.m., but Hamid, if you have some closing thoughts, sort of um, tying things together or reflections of your own, would love to hear from you. Thank you. I thank you. I apologize again for being late a little bit. Uh, well, I, when I'm hearing everybody, I share with them something. So from Syria, I share war, displacement, displacement frustration. So from Turkey, I'm feeling the freedom of academic freedom. So how it is, you know, something that we share all together because we feel that it's written everywhere. From Palestine, of course, this is a long history uh, about, about conflict and war and more frustration again. So let me share with you a few points. One is about what even uh, everyone said about uh, how our competence and our experiences and diplomas are devaluated when we come to a, a, a foreign country. Um, I have my PhD from Sorbonne University. I speak French, I speak Arabic, I speak English. So I teach French for uh, almost uh, uh, more than 20 years. So I came, it's like my mother tongue, French is almost like Arabic. So I talk it like my mother tongue. When I came here, I don't find a job. 
with, I was a dean, I was a, I am a, a full professor with more than 25 years. So there is a historical cost behind my competencies that, because this is times, this is publication. I have more than 20, uh, more than 12 books. I have, uh, I was the uh, head uh, editor, the chief, uh, chief editor of an encyclopedia, uh, more than uh, uh, for the 5,000 pages. So when you arrive there, you are, you are nothing. This is the word that could be used. And our family are fragmented. My, my two daughters are two, both of them are in France. They can't come here. My, uh, part, my, uh, the rest of my family stay in Yemen. I am here in the United States with my wife and my son. It's, it's good. Okay, to be uh, at least uh, three of us are here. And the problem of integrated the academia in the United States is based on connection. When you arrive from, yes, it's based on connection. You need to have connection here and there. And you can't do that when you arrive. Okay, little by little, we can construct such connection and people uh, start to understand that, okay, you can offer something. Now I'm happy because I'm teaching in two different universities. I have now a home campus, but at least people recognized in a few time that you can offer something. Uh, but you still start from zero, from scratch, as some of you said. So I'm starting like a, an instructor. What is instructor? For me, after 25 years of uh, teaching, after 25 years of publishing after 20 years, uh, 20 more 20 than 25 years of heading seminars, meeting, conferences, be ambassador. I was ambassador to UNESCO for five years. So you start as an instructor and you say, yes, you, you don't have the, the right to say no because you need to make the two ends meet. This is what we are here. So. I thank those who work for those who are in such situation, especially Global Academy that put it up together here because this is a kind of, uh, how we say, a, a, a relief treatment for our pain, our frustration. When we talk together, I'm not the only one who is suffering, but I share with you some, some kind of suffering, okay? And we share the, 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 the volunteer to say, well, we'll do something and we'll change the situation. And I'm happy to share with you these ideas. Uh, I left Yemen, of course, because of the war, because of the danger, I mean, I mean uh, the direct danger, because there was bombardment, there was destruction, uh, but also because there is a, a, a kind of a persecution, there is a forced disappearance, there is insecurity, in secure environment. So you, we don't choose our situation. I don't know, I don't want to leave Yemen, but I'm here because of that situation. So for the publication, uh, I, I continue to publish in Arabic, in English, in French a little bit, but it is not really my project. I have uh, several projects that was suspended a third publication of the, the encyclopedia, which was for the 2020. I couldn't do anything about it. So uh, we lost uh, in, 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 that, in that terrain. Um, I thank you to uh, give me the opportunity to share with my colleagues here my pain a little bit, and also my hope that with, uh, uh, with that kind of uh, uh, how we say collaborative co, uh, co help to co assistance kind of work together that we can overcome our pain, our difficulties, and perhaps get back to our correct and uh, right level of acad in academia. Thank you so much. Thank you, Hamid. Um, and I'll I'll add just the importance of. Uh, allies, having sort of allies in these institutions who are not, you know, who, who are citizens or, or permanent residents um, who can work um, 
and support work with you and support uh, support what you deserve. Um, I want to extend deep gratitude to all of you once again. Uh, this recording will be available on uh, on Jezalia's YouTube as well as um, the Ten Years On Project website. The link for that is the Arab Uprisings.org. Um, and we will be in touch with uh, more 10 Years On Project panels uh, in the coming months. And we thank you all for tuning in. And thank you, especially to our presenters, for being here. Good night, everyone. Thank you. Thank you, so thank you everyone. Thank you. Thank, thank you for all. your connection. Thank you. Thanks. Bye.